Albert Einstein could not believe it. Erwin Schrödinger hated it. And Henrik Lorenz was sorry that he lived too long to learn about it. I am talking about a theory that is the most accurate description of reality that we ever had. Hello and welcome to the eighth episode of my online course on special relativity. My name is Andrzej Dragan. I'm a professor of theoretical physics at University of Warsaw and National University of Singapore. And today I will not be talking about relativity at all. I'm going to make a detour to talk about the quantum theory. The discovery of quantum theory took nearly three decades and more than 10 Nobel Prizes. And those who achieved it became heroes of physics. But many of these heroes lost their cool once they realized what are the consequences of their own discoveries. Max Planck, who was the author of the term quantum, doubted quantum theory. Erwin Schrödinger, the author of the famous Schrödinger equation, hated quantum theory so much that he was sorry to even have anything to do with it. Hendrik Lorenz once wrote that he was sorry to even live long enough to learn about it. And Albert Einstein was famous for not believing quantum theory and repeating those famous words, God does not play dice. And it's amazing that quantum theory is so easy to understand, but so hard to accept. And all it really takes to embrace this quantum weirdness can be summarized in two elementary thought experiments. <laughs> Imagine a simple piece of glass and a ray of light falling onto it. Any glass transmits only some of the light and the rest is reflected or absorbed. And it's easy to see, just look at your own reflection in a window. But for simplicity, let us assume that our glass plate transmits exactly half of light and the rest is reflected. And this can be easily verified by placing a pair of ideal photodetectors behind the glass plate. Now, it is known from the works of Max Planck and Albert Einstein that light consists of indivisible particles called photons. And these photons are very simple objects. They can be fully described by characterizing their color and polarization. So let us assume that our light has a specific color, for example, red, and it's already polarized in a given direction so that all the photons in the ray of light are exactly the same. They all have the same red color and the same polarization. And now the tricky question arrives. If all these photons are really the same, then why some of them are reflected and others transmitted? We could even repeat the whole experiment with single photons and shoot individual photons at the glass plate. Then although these photons are identical, still some of these photons will be transmitted, but some will be reflected. So what makes them act differently? The first possibility that comes to mind is that these photons are in fact not identical. There could be some microscopical differences between those photons that we simply haven't discovered yet. So let's imagine that these photons are indeed different, and maybe some of them have hairs and the other don't, and maybe only the hairy photons can go through the glass. Who knows? But then if you place another glass plate behind the first one and verify how many photons go through it, we should expect that since all the hairy photons have already been filtered out at the first glass plate, all of them should also go through the second one. But if you perform such an experiment, and this has been done numerous times, it turns out that still half of the photons will be transmitted and the other half reflected. And so far in similar experiments, not the slightest deviation from the 50-50 rule has been found. And people have tried really hard, which suggests that the photons really seem to be identical. And there must be something else that causes photons to act differently in this experiment. So perhaps it's the piece of glass that makes the difference. And maybe the glass that is made of a huge number of atoms fluctuates 
And these fluctuations can make photons act differently. So one time a photon could be bounced off the glass plate. But after a while, when atoms have moved a little bit, another photon could go through. Before I discuss with you the next crucial experiment showing that nothing in the process of the interaction with the glass can decide the fate of the photon, let me tell you what quantum theory has to say about that. And it says something absolutely crazy. The reason behind a particular behavior of the photon does not exist at all. Behavior of photons is fundamentally unpredictable, or as physicists like to say, indeterministic. And there is nothing in the process of interaction with the photon and the glass that can decide the outcome of this experiment. So according to quantum theory, behavior of single photons is fundamentally different from coin flip experiments in which you toss a coin and tiny details decide about the coin's fate. Photons are not like coins. And here's why. So let us complicate things a little bit. Let us consider the same piece of glass that is now followed by a pair of ideal mirrors that reflect the two outgoing beams and direct them towards another piece of glass at which the beams are recombined. And to see what happens to the light at the second glass plate, we will place a pair of ideal photodetectors behind it. And the first question we can ask is what happens to a strong beam of light injected into this system? In what proportions will it reach the two detectors? And the first answer that comes to mind is that since uh, the beam will be divided into halves at the first beam splitter, then the same thing has to happen on the second piece of glass and eventually half of light will reach the higher detector and the remaining half will reach the lower detector. And here comes a surprise. There is a way to perform this experiment in such a way that all of light will reach the lower detector and none of it will reach the higher one. So how is it possible? You have to remember that light is an electromagnetic wave and like any other waves, when two of those overlap, then they can either enhance each other when the highs of the waves overlap ideally, or they can cancel out each other if the highs of one wave overlap with the lows of the other one. And notice that light that reaches the higher detector through the higher path gets reflected three times, but the light that reaches the higher detector through the lower path gets reflected only once, but has to go through the glass twice. And light traveling through glass is slowed down, which means that the lower beam will be delayed as compared to the higher beam. And the amount of that delay depends on the thickness of the glass and its index of refraction. And we can pick those quantities in such a way that when the two beams overlap at the second beam splitter, the corresponding light waves will simply cancel out so that all of the light will reach the lower detector. And that phenomenon is called interference, which can be either constructive when two waves enhance each other or destructive when they cancel out. And now a big question is coming. Because we have to ask, what happens if we inject a single photon in our system? So when that photon falls on the first glass plate, it has to make a decision whether to reflect or transmit itself. And either way, it has to reach the second glass plate, make another decision, and then with probability 50%, it will reach one of the detectors. Or at least that's what we think. Because in the real experiment, when we inject a single photon, it will always reach the lower detector. And that shows that there must be some sort of interference going on. But interference between what? After all, all that we have in this experiment is just a single photon. And it has nothing to interfere with. Is it interfering with itself? Well, it appears so. It appears as if the photon was split at the first beam splitter and then went along two paths at the same time and then interfered with itself, which seems to contradict our assumption that the photon is indivisible, remember? So we can test it, we can just place another pair of detectors to find out where the photon really is. But if we do that, 
that's really going back to the first experiment that we have carried out. And we already know that our photon will be caught in a single place, either here or here. And the outcome is completely unpredictable, but we will never find the photon at two places at the same time. So, what happens in this experiment is that as long as we do not observe the photon, it behaves as if it was going along two paths at the same time. But if you make an observation along the way to discover the real position of the photon, it will always make a decision and reveal itself only at one place. And that crazy situation, that crazy phenomenon is called a quantum superposition. It takes place whenever a system, a particle or anything else behaves as it was realizing two or more scenarios at the same time. If you are shocked by all this, it's fine. Niels Bohr, who was the grandfather and grandmother of quantum theory, used to say that if you are not shocked by it, you simply haven't understood it. But here's something crucial. We can perform our interference experiment, delaying the choice whether to slide the extra pair of detectors and observe the photon or not. So we can inject the photon, calculate when, when it's going to reach the glass plate and bounce off or go through it, wait a little bit more, and then decide whether to observe the photon or not. And if you decide to observe the photon, it will emerge only at one random place. But if we do not observe the photon, then it will behave as if it was going along two paths at the same time. So the decision where the photon emerges in the experiment has to take place at the exact moment of observation and not earlier when it was interacting with the glass. And yet Albert Einstein kept repeating that God does not play dice. No! Until Niels Bohr replied, stop telling God what to do. And I like Richard Feynman's comment on this, who said that if you don't like the way nature works, just go somewhere else. And speaking of Feynman, in his famous lectures on physics, he discusses these problems, and then he makes the following remark. One might still like to ask, how does it work? What is the machinery behind the law? No one has found any machinery behind the law. No one can explain any more than we have just explained. No one will give you any deeper representation of the situation. We have no ideas about a more basic mechanism from which these results can be deduced. Challenge accepted. In the next episode, I'm going to discuss my work with Arthur Eckert, the creator of quantum cryptography, in which we claim that there exists a more basic mechanism underlying quantum theory. And that mechanism has to do with special relativity and the existence of superluminal frames of reference. If you'd like to read about it already, get a copy of my textbook on relativity, where I discuss all these problems in much greater detail. The book is called Unusually Special Relativity. The link is in the description. But today you have already plenty of stuff to digest. So thank you for listening and get out of here. No, 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 no!